what we have here. What I want to do today is just look at the first verse. And the outline's very simple for the message. I printed some off, but as usual, I forgot to give them out to people. And so you can imagine what they look like. They're here on the screen. This is what they look like. And the first point of the outline is the author, the second point, the recipients, and then the greeting. Lord willing, I want to focus on the greeting. However, I am going to give you some facts about the author and the recipients just to kind of give an overview of the book. But the greeting, I think, is very important. There are two words in this greeting that really are like the whole of Christian theology. They are grace and peace. You've heard these words maybe even so many times that it will be nice to kind of look at um, how important really they are. And uh, grace and peace. So let's just get right into it. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's get to know Paul a little bit. For those of you that have been here for a while or studied your Bible, you've heard about Paul. Let's begin at a murder scene. If you can flip around in your Bible quickly, if you want to go to the book of Acts chapter 7. The book of Acts chapter 7 contains a historical account of the first Christian martyr losing his life for his faith in Christ. His name is Stephen. Stephen in Acts chapter 7 You know, he was a Jew, and he went to speak to the leaders of the Jews, and he was going to tell them, hey, Jews, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament scriptures that said that the Savior of the world was going to come, that the Messiah was going to come. And Stephen essentially is telling all these Jewish leaders, the, the, you know, the religious professionals, if you will, he's saying, Jesus is the one that you've been waiting for. And then everything's going pretty well in his message, and then he gets to a point to where he says, but here's the bad part about it, you killed him. (laughs) And then they all, at that point, they start, it says they start gnashing their teeth, and they start like freaking out, and they're going to just kill him. And look what they do in Acts chapter 7, uh, starting at verse 58. They cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. They literally picked up rocks in their hand, and they threw it at this guy's head until he died. And look at the next thing there. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, here's the kind of the scene. Stephen, they don't like him anymore, so let's pick up stones and let's throw at him. But first I got to take off my coat. And so here, hold my coat. And this guy that's holding his coat's named Paul or Saul. You know him as Paul, but his Hebrew name is Saul, right? And so Saul is holding the coats and he's watching this guy get pelted with rocks until he loses his life. Now turn to Acts chapter 9. There's going to be a lot of this flipping around. I hope that you like that. I enjoy it tremendously. Acts chapter 9, then Saul, verse 1, breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. This is Saul. He is trying to kill Christians. This is, he is a Jew, he's a zealous Jew, he's a Jewish professional. If there was ever a title called super Jew, this would be Saul. Now, Saul is so zealous for Judaism that he thinks that anything that comes against it, he thinks that it honors God for him to go out and get rid of it, to wipe it out. And so in his mind, Jesus is against God. So Saul, breathing out threats and murders, verse 1 of Acts 9 there, he goes out and he's essentially got some search warrants and he's going to rip Christians out of their house, take them to be locked up and beaten. As you read on in chapter 9 of Acts, you see that he's going on his way to a city called Damascus, and then this bright light shines out of nowhere. And Saul is taken to the ground by this light. And while he's doing it, uh, on the ground, while he's taken to the ground, he hears this voice, uh, and it says, Saul, you know, why are you persecuting me? You know, and Saul's blinded by the light, and he can't, he's, what do you mean? Who are you, Lord? What do you mean that I'm persecuting you? I'm paraphrasing Acts chapter 9 here. And then Jesus speaks to him, and he says, it's me, Jesus, that you're persecuting. You know, it's been hard for you to kick against the calling I have on your life, you know, and you keep doing that, but you're actually persecuting me. And we come to find out later, he really wants him to serve him, not to persecute the church and not to persecute Jesus. So Paul, at that point, Saul says, Lord, what, what should I do? And he says, get up and go into this town of Damascus. You'll be blind for three days. The guy's going to come pray, lay hands on you. You'll receive your sight again. And I want you to go serve me. By the way, 
In Acts chapter 9, when Jesus speaks to him, this is after Jesus has been crucified, buried, and resurrected. Jesus is speaking to Saul in a post-resurrected state, okay? We're talking about the Apostle Paul here in 1 Thessalonians, the first word there. This is Saul. This is Paul. I want you to take away, there's, there's three things that you could pull from Paul. The first one, Paul, Saul is a strong encouragement for anyone that has a past that wants to serve Jesus, is he not? I mean, I used to wrestle with this. I'd say, well, you know, you don't know how bad I've been in my past. I don't think I could even probably make coffee in the house of the Lord because I'm ruined forever. And people would try to console me and comfort me. Oh, you know, you know, God forgive sins, brother. And I would always be thinking, no, you don't know me. You don't know me, buddy. Well, have you ever... Um, been like Saul? Have you ever like murdered anybody? I mean, have you ever been out to like destroy? Listen, there's probably not a greater sin that we see in the scripture, something that makes Jesus more upset than people getting in the way of people coming to Jesus, right? And that's what Saul did. But then listen to what Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 12 through 16. Let me just read this to you. You don't need to turn there. It says this. This is, this is Paul later on talking to Timothy. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that cool? And he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And then he says this, however, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. You know what Paul said? He goes, man, I'm the chief of sinners. I used to persecute Christians. I was a blasphemer. I used to keep people from coming to the Lord, but God gave me mercy. And he did it as a pattern. You know, if, if ever that pattern is evident, it is in the Calvary Chapel movement. <laughs> you know what I mean? There, you have no idea the testimony of Calvary Chapel pastors. Literally like, okay, I was selling acid and going to shoot somebody because my wife slept with another guy. And in the middle of that, I saw Chuck Smith on TV, put the shotgun down, gave my life to the Lord. Now I'm a megachurch pastor. I mean, Calvary Chapel movement is filled with those kind of people. That's why I feel at home, you know, there is because... You know, it's kind of a good, well, it's kind of a good reminder, you know, of like, there's nothing that you've done in your past that disqualifies you from serving the Lord. If you will but come to him and receive his mercy and his regeneration, his cleansing, his forgiveness, he wants to use you, okay? So that's one of the first three things that you can pull from Paul is, uh, you know, he's a strong, uh, you know, encouragement for anybody with a past that wants to serve Jesus. Here's the next one. The... The life of Apostle Paul here is strong evidence for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? How does a man go from being completely committed to destroying Christianity, complete 180, to the point to where he serves Jesus until literally it comes down to him getting his head lopped off? Nero cuts his head off eventually because he won't give up on Jesus, How does a guy go from persecuting Jesus to my head's lopped off for Jesus if he didn't see something that was really convincing, right? It's pretty evident that whatever happened to him on the Damascus Road was so impacting that he was willing to give his life for it. People don't do that stuff for a lie. So strong evidence for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the next of the three things that you can pull from Paul. Paul, there's a strong exhortation to all of us to work with others. Notice how it says Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Any time that you see Paul at work, I mean, you see he's at work with other people. He's not a lone ranger. He's not a celebrity either, you know, like there's a lot of Christian celebrities today where they're just like, you know, um, sell, their faces all over everything, selling the books and all this other stuff. And it's like they're higher than everybody else, you know. Um, there's a parking spot reserved for him, reserved for the guy that's higher than everybody else. You ever see that sign out in the parking lot? You don't see that sign here, praise the Lord, but reserved for the guy that's better than everybody. <laughs> Reserved for the organist. <laughs> Have you ever seen that one? I mean, that's okay because she has a hard time getting in the church. She's like, oh, you know. 
But Paul wasn't like that. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't elevated above anybody else, and he worked with other people. And so those three things you can pull from Paul. No matter how bad your past is, you can serve the Lord. He wants to use you. The fact that his life was a 180, strong evidence for the resurrection of Christ. And the third point from Paul's life, don't be a lone ranger. Work with other people. You're not better than anybody. And just let's work as a group. Now, Silvanus, the next name in verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians. Um, Roman version of the word Silas. You remember the name Silas throughout the scriptures, right? You've seen him in the book of Acts. Silas means woody. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Now, every time that you read that, you'd be like, excuse, Woody came and joined him on the, you know, makes you think of Toy Story. Next time you kids watch Toy Story and you see Woody, you'll think, Silas, the book of Acts. Oh, the Bible's so much better than Toy Story. <laughs> then the next name there, Timothy. Timothy means honoring God. Two things that we can take from Timothy. Proven character, number one, and his humanity. In the book of Philippians, turn there if you'd like, New Testament book, Philippians chapter 2, verses 17 through 23. Paul's going to say some cool stuff about Timothy. His proven character. You know, I've heard a lot of guys tell me in life, they say, I didn't grow up with a good influence in my life. Well, I, me either, but check it out. The Bible's filled with them, right? You've got the Apostle Paul, you've got Timothy, you've got the best one of all, Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 Verses 17 through 23. Now, a little background. Paul is writing to this church in Philippi. He's got a trial coming up. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He might be done with his life. He might go on. He's not very sure. But what he's going to do is he wants to send Timothy to them just to kind of see how they're doing. And that's the context. Verse 17. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith... I am glad and rejoice with you all. In other words, if I lose my life for serving the Lord, I'm glad and I rejoice with you all. Verse 18. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus." But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. Notice the things Paul says there. He goes, I want to send Timothy to you. I have no one else. And by the way, this is kind of sad to me because Paul hung out with a lot of people. And he says, but I have no one else that is like-minded. Isn't that sad? The Apostle Paul worked with all kinds of people. He says, Philippians, I want to send this guy to you, and I'm excited to do it because I have no one else like him. Nobody else is like-minded. And then he goes on to give the reasons why. He says, they all seek their own, not the things of Christ Jesus. And that is the sad tale of a lot of people. They're just out for themselves. And that's what Paul said about Timothy, though. He goes, he's not like that, man. He cares about the things about Christ. I care about the things about Christ. We're like-minded. We want to serve you. And he has proven character. Now, back in Thessalonians, the next two books afterwards are First and Second Timothy, and then it goes to Titus. All the T's in the New Testament are together, by the way. It's very easy to find them. But First and Second Timothy are letters written to Timothy by Paul, encouraging him as a young pastor as he pastored the church in Ephesus. And he was encouraging Timothy essentially to stand firm. There's false teachers all around. You've got to go at it, Timothy. So the first thing that we take from the life of Timothy is his proven character. The next thing is his humanity. And I love this. I'm encouraged by this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. You can flip to this one or I'm going to read it regardless. 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 through 7. He's talking to Timothy. Therefore, I remind you, Timothy, to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on my hands, of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Isn't that encouraging? Mighty man of God, Timothy. You know, sometimes people call him timid Timothy. When you read about the stuff that he was involved in, I don't think he was probably timid. I think he was maybe a little nervous and had stress issues a little bit. And maybe, according to verse 7 here, maybe he was a little bit fearful when it came 
to all the obstacles that he was up against. And maybe what it seems like here is it seems like maybe the fear of just life and ministry and just trying to be a godly man, maybe that fear got to him to the point to where he was starting to sort of fizzle out. And I say that because verse 6, Paul says, Therefore, I remind you to stir up. Now, that word stir up, the gift of God, the word stir up has to do, well, have you ever been at a fire and, and it's going down to the embers? And you get the billows out and you, you stir the thing that's on its way out back up into a flame again. That's what the Greek word has the idea of there, stir up. I'm really encouraged by Timothy's humanity because he needs people to come along alongside of him at certain points in life and say, look, man, you need to stir this up, right? Maybe that's where somebody is today. You've had the hands laid on you. We prayed for you. You know God saved you. He's gifted you. And you need to stir this up. That's a lesson I had to learn. It took me years in ministry that I need to ask God for help to keep this fire going inside of me. I I need to stir it up. That's a lesson of ministry right there. I've got to stir this up. This is something I take from the life of Timothy. First of all, his proven character. I want to be a man of character. I want to be like-minded with Paul and with Jesus and with Timothy and with everybody else. And I want to, um, you know, be aware of my humanity. So I'm calling out to the Lord. I'm asking to be stirred up. And I'm taking whatever responsibility is of my own to stay stirred up. How do you keep the gifts stirred up within you? You stay in the Word. You stay in fellowship. You stay in prayer. You receive encouragement from others. You're not a lone ranger like, you know, Paul wasn't. Things like that. Mighty man of God needs to be told, hey, the fire's going out. Do something, right? So... That's our first point there, the author. you got the Apostle Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Number two, the recipients. It goes on in verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians. So Paul, Silvanus, Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I read their commentaries, and what that is is a statement of equality. He's not saying that God the Father and then separately Jesus Christ. Paul is placing them with the construction of the Greek here on the same level. He's saying they're one and of the same. Two things, two more things I want to focus on in that section. The church, that word church, and then the word Thessalonians. Now, church has a lot of meanings today. Um, You could open the yellow pages and find a Buddhist church. You could open a... uh, I mean, there's a church of Satan, isn't there? Like, the, the church, there's a church of the flying spaghetti monster. Uh, really? These are legitimate things. Church of Scientology. So it's kind of a weird, confused word. Lots of meanings today. The definition of the word church here, and by the way, everybody knows the Bible was written in the language called Koine Greek. It means common Greek. It's the language of the Greek of the Roman Empire. Um, the Bible was written in Greek, and then it was translated into English. And so sometimes we look at the Greek language just to kind of get a deeper understanding of the words there. You don't have to be a master of the Greek language to read the Bible. The translations are very good. But sometimes it's helpful. So let's look at this word, the word church. In the Greek, the definition is, uh, the the word translated uh, church here, the word is ekklesia. Ekklesia. And essentially, it has a simple definition. It means called out ones. It's a compound word, two words that it comes from, ek and kaleo. Ek meaning out. Kaleo means to call or to summons. So the called out ones, the ecclesia are the ones that have been called out. Now, originally, in the Greek language, in the Greek culture at this time, it just meant a word for any assembly that was called out by somebody and, you know, a gathering. It just was a word that meant a gathering or an assembly. In a Christian sense, ecclesia means a gathering of people that have been called to come together to meet with God. It's kind of interesting that, you know, I just use the language, I say, well, hey, where do you want to meet? Well, let's meet at the church. Well, but technically, that's you know, it's the church building. We know what we mean. But technically, church is people, not a building, right? Technically, church is people, not a building. And it makes me think of like this question I get a lot as a pastor. It's, more, it's not really a question. It's more of a statement of somebody telling me off. 
and they say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And I'm thinking inside in my like sarcastic, like, you know, voice, I'm saying, well, you know, if you knew your Bible, you'd know that you are the church. (laughs) Now, whether you're being a good church member, that's another question or not. But the whole like, you know, I don't have to go to church. Hey, you are the church partner. And God has called you to do certain things as a church member. Now, whether you're doing them or not, you know, meeting together with others, loving others, serving one another, uh, you know, wash it. You know, as Jesus said, they'll know you by your love for one another. How, how are you going to know anybody by your love for the church if you don't go around the church, you know? So, you know, that question is, you know, do I have to go to church and be a Christian? Well, no, you are the church, but how are you doing at that? You know, that's the real question. So, so what? We're God's people called to his assembly, his gathering. And what a privilege that is that you sitting here today have been called purposefully by God to be the church. That's a really cool privilege. You can be called to be involved in a lot of things, but this gathering is different than any other gathering happening, you know, around. It's not the garden club, you know, it's not the uh, coffee of the month club. It's God's club. And he purposefully called you to be part of the body. That also tells me that, you know, you have to deal with me because I've been called uh, to be into his body just as much as you have. I'm called to love you. You're called to love me, even if I'm hard to love. The church is a really cool word, the more you sit and think about it, that it's a people, not a place. It's an organism, not an organization. It's a really cool thing. He goes on, next word there, Thessalonians. The church of God, or the church in, uh, of the Thessalonians. What are Thessalonians? Well, they're called that because they live in Thessalonica. (laughs) Duh. (laughs) Just kidding. All right, let's talk a little bit about the city. It used to be named Thermi, and uh, it's because it was by some thermal springs. And then this guy named Cassander, he was the brother-in-law of Alexander the Great. You might know him from history class a little bit. I'm no history buff, but uh, he was his brother-in-law, and he refounded the city in 315 B.C., before Christ, and then he named it Thessalonica after his wife. Now, as I was reading this, I thought, man, when Valentine's Day comes around, I hope that my wife doesn't say, look at this gift that you got me. Well, Cassander named a city after his wife, and look at... (laughs) So that's how it got its name. The location was right between Derby and Philippi, and if you know your book of Acts, Philippi was where Paul and Silas were in prison around midnight. They're singing hymns. The earthquake comes. Philippian jailer gets saved. They get run out of town. Lacerations all in their back, bruised, beaten, bloody for Christ, and then they go down the road, and they end up in Thessalonica. They plant a church there. Population at the time, 200,000. It's not some little town. We think about these ancient cities. We get this image in our mind that, you know, there's some ancient little quaint thing, but it's a big metropolitan city, all the vice that you could think of. The religion there, there were some influential Jews, but mostly it was pagan idolatry. Idolatry, you know, we think of it as statues, right? And we think that's so primitive. We watched that Brady Bunch episode where they go to Hawaii and they find the tiki god. You guys remember that one? It's a little thing. And um, we think all these guys are so primitive, they worship these statues. Well, actually, they didn't, they were worshiping the idea that the statue represented, right? One could represent power, money, intellect, sex, beauty, strength, whatever. And so then people involved in idolatry, what they would do is they would make sacrifices to these things because what they're saying is life is all about money, power, respect, sex, beauty, intellect. And so they would make sacrifices to those gods. They would work hard, they'd make their money, and they'd spend their money on these things. You see? Now, it doesn't seem so primitive anymore, does it? We're maybe a little more sophisticated in the sense where we don't have a, you know, a statue on the mantle. I might not go to your house and go, oh, yeah, you know, statue to mammon. Cool, you worship money. Cool, let's talk. The idols are now in your heart. We're a little too sophisticated to have the statue. We're not as honest as they were. You go to their house and they had the statue out. You say, oh, I know what you're all about. You live for sex. Oh, I can tell by the thing right here, you know. Today, these are idols of the heart. So they're not all unlike us. They live for things other than God. Things other than God take priority in their lives in this day, just like they do in our day today. I'm really encouraged, though, because when you read in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, when this church was planted, it says how the church was planted. In this culture of idolatry, people worshiping money, sex, drugs, power, all this other stuff, Paul brought in this simple message. You have a problem with sin? 
You've offended God. God wants to remedy it. It's Jesus is the remedy. He died on a cross. He was buried. He resurrected three days later. And he wants you to put your faith in him. And if you do, you will be saved. He brought that simple message to 200,000 people, Thessalonica, idolaters. They got saved and there was a church there. That's pretty encouraging. Same message then as it is here today. That's encouraging to me. Why did Paul write? Well, he was in Thessalonica. It says only for like three weeks. And then he got run out of town. And so he plants a church. It's only three weeks old and he gets run out of town. Eventually he ends up in Corinth and he, you know, probably has his secretary write off a letter and send this letter back. Um, and, and that's the whole purpose of it is Thessalonians, I, you know, Timothy visited you. He told me you're doing pretty well, but he said you have some questions about end times and the rapture and all this stuff. And so, and uh, he heard there were some problems maybe with moral purity there and things like that. So Paul writes Thessalonians, Thessalonians to this church uh, to instruct them about end times a little bit, give them a moral exhortation, and primarily too, just to express his gratitude for them. It's kind of a surprise that they were still going. You know, they were in the midst of a ton of persecution and a brand new church and they're going, they're thriving. In fact, the whole known world has heard about their faith, their examples to people. And we're going to learn more about that as we go through. So that's why he writes. And then he says uh, to the church in Thessalonica, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and we talked about that, a statement of equality. That is their, their physical location is Thessalonica. Their spiritual location, if you will, is in God and the Father. They're getting, like Jesus says, the vine and the branches illustration. They're drawing their life and their source from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the greeting. Last point. He says this, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Typical greeting of the day was Carry on, C H A I R E O N. Paul doesn't use that word here. He uses the word charis. Paul changed it from just a word that's like greetings to grace. And that might not seem significant to us, but it's extremely significant with an understanding of Christianity. Carry on just has the idea of like, you know, cheers, you know, greetings, you know. But grace has a different idea in the eyes of Paul, in the heart of Paul. Let me give you a definition. The word grace, the word in the Koine Greek translated grace is the word charis. And every time I say that word, I'm reminded of the sweetest little girl that I know, uh, Karis Wilson, who is my friend Kevin's daughter. You guys may have met her before. It's just a sweetheart. What a name for a kid, you know, Karis. Charis is the word translated grace here. It's where we get our word charity, or, uh, and it means goodwill or loving kindness, benevolence, good favor. A Christian understanding of this word is it's God's unmerited favor towards undeserving sinners. God's unmerited favor towards undeserving sinners. Like, you don't deserve it. There's nothing you can do to earn it, but God gives it to you. This, this is one of Paul's favorite words. I mean, he uses this word so many times. If you highlight every time the word grace is in the New Testament, I mean, you need a new highlighter. It's a favor done without expectation of anything in return. The absolutely free expression of the loving kindness of God to men, finding its only motive in the bounty and benevolence of the giver. That's what another Greek scholar says. I don't normally use words that are that many syllables. But it has the idea of it's a favor done, not expecting anything in return. It really has nothing to do with you, but I love you, and that's the only reason I want to do it. I don't want anything in return. The whole motive of it exists in me, not in you, right? I heard a pastor always use a good illustration. He says sometimes he keeps candy in his pockets, you know, and some, past, some parents don't like that because they don't want their kids to eat candy. But they come up to him after, after uh, service and he gives them a piece of candy, right? And um, he just says, just, I just want you to have this, you know, just because it's you. But if he says, oh, hey, little, uh, little girl, 
that's such a cute little dress. Here you go. At that point, it's not grace anymore. Now he's rewarding her for her cute dress. You see, it's changed. Grace would be here. No reason, just because I love you. Right? The word charity, right? If I donate something to charity, say that I go out to, say I go over to the hospital and I'm a wealthy millionaire. I'm a billionaire. Millionaire don't even have any money today. And I go over there and I say, I would like to donate some money to the hospital and I just want to do some charity. And, they, and we get all the plans drawn up for the new wing that's going to be built over there. And everything's about to happen and groundbreaking. And they got their big scissors and uh, all the pomp. And they got the tape recording of the pomp and circumstance. And um, they're about to cut. And I say, no, 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 stop, stop. We're not, it's not quite ready yet. Before you do this, I want you to take a picture of me. And can you make a plaque? And can you put it on the door right there? The, the, and then it will just say the Adam Tyler wing. Can you, you know? I mean, I'm doing all this charity for you. Well, wait a minute. That's not charity anymore. Now it's a wage. I just bought a $5 million plaque. You see the difference? So when Paul says grace and peace to you, he's saying something tremendous. He's saying God has given something to you, no strings attached, just because he loves you. Just because he loves me, he gives this to me. You say, well, yeah, I I get that. Do you? It's interesting, the order of grace and peace here, because you, you always find them in that order, grace and peace. Here's the definition of peace. It's the word Irene. It looks like my wife's name with a couple extra E's. E-I-R-E-N-E. She's so peaceful. It's like, her name means peace. Now, a variation of this Greek word, and it means contention. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Only when I cause it. She responds to it. (laughs) Peace, here's the definition. The tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot, no matter what that is. Isn't that nice? Tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, fearing nothing from God, content with its earthly lot no matter what it is. God's peace is not just the absence of conflict, but the fullness of health and harmony through the reconciliation with him and with each other. You've heard in the Bible where it says the peace that passes understanding. That's what this is. Now, so what, right? This greeting is so important and these things go in this order. Many people don't have true peace today. Is that a safe assumption? Is that, I mean, if you called the pharmaceutical company and you said, how many pills are you dishing out for anxiety right now? How many people are coming to the psychologist with fear and worry and lack of peace? How many people are scraping and scrambling to get to the top of a corporate ladder or something? Or they're, or they're constantly needing busyness or they're constantly, uh, you know, going from one lover to the next or they're constantly, you know, drinking just to sleep at night. How many people in this world do you think are missing true peace? It's unfortunate. How many Christians do you think are missing true peace today? It's unfortunate because nobody has to forfeit true peace. Many people don't have it because they have not received God's grace. Now, just in these last few minutes, I want to talk to you about grace and peace. Why are humans not at peace to begin with? If you will, could I get you to turn to Genesis chapter 3? It's always good to start at the beginning if you ask me. Why are people not at peace today? If you're listening to this now and you're like, man, he's nailing me. I'm not at peace. Listen, every single human by birth is restless. Every one of us. Now, Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 7, but let me give you a little backstory. In the beginning, God created everything, and he created man and women eventually, put them in the garden, and everything was good, and they had this perfect fellowship with God. Adam and Eve, her name wasn't Eve yet, but the man and the woman, they had perfect relationship with God. Their conscience was perfectly still, absolutely tranquil. Everything was perfect. The closest thing you could think about it is a baby on an umbilical cord. 
That baby doesn't do anything. It just gets everything it needs through that attachment. It's, until that thing is cut, it's perfection. The relationship is just perfect. Adam and Eve are with God, and they're walking in the cool of the day, and they're just enjoying the Creator. He's enjoying them. He made them. He loves them. They're loving Him. Everything is perfect, right? But God, in His wisdom, He says, I want them to truly love me, so He gives them a choice not to love Him, because that's the only way true love can happen, and He gives them this this command. He says, look, you can do whatever you want. Just enjoy me. I love you. You love me. We're together. You have meaningful stuff to do in this garden. You can, you can just do all the gardening. You ladies are like, yeah, I'd love to do the gardening. Some guys, you know, we, yeah. And they're just having fruitful gardening. It's beautiful, but just don't do one thing. And of course, you know the story. Um, the serpent comes along, goes to Eve and says, hey, you know, did God say you're not supposed to eat that tree? And she adds to it. She says, he said he's not, we're not supposed to eat it or even touch the thing because, you know, he's playing or making her think God's harsh. And, oh, no, he just said, don't eat it. He didn't say, don't touch it. Well, you know how it goes. She looks at it and she goes, oh, that'd probably be good in my stomach. And you know what? It'd make me wise. Cool. I'll be smarter. I'll be prideful, and, you know probably tastes good. It looks good. Okay, I'll go ahead and eat it. And you know what she does? She takes it and she gives it to her husband. And he eats it. And verse 7 of Genesis 3. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. Now, this doesn't have the idea of they just knew they were, you know, oh my gosh, (laughs) you know, I got to cover up. It has more the idea of exposed vulnerable in a way that they didn't even know that there's something's wrong. Something's wrong. I'm missing something now, right? And what do they do? What do they do? They take action upon themselves. They do some works. And what they do is they sew some fig leaves together and they made themselves coverings. You see that in Genesis 7 there? This is when fruit of the loom incorporated. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You see what happened? They disobeyed God. They all of a sudden became self-conscious. They became weirded out, right? They're not comfortable in their own skin anymore. Something's wrong. This fellowship is disrupted. I, got, I know what I'll do. I'll hide myself. I'll cover myself. And they do with some fig leaves. And it's been said, you know, that fig leaves are probably very itchy and cumbersome and it probably wasn't a very good thing to make a bikini out of, um, but they did. And uh, then they sold it on Etsy. No, I'm just joking. Gosh, I got to stop with that. Verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The cool of the day. It should have been a good thing. It's the cool of the day. Just as usual, here's the Lord. They hear his voice. Same thing that's always happened, but something is different now. Verse 8 there, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Now they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Oh my gosh, this is tragic. This is when the soundtrack turned minor. Verse 9, And the Lord God called to Adam, and he said to him, Where are you? Now, I don't think he was like, Where are you? Like you've been taught when you were a kid, maybe. I think he was like, Where are you? Where are you? You know, that's my impression. (laughs) Sorry, God, if that's wrong. Verse 10, So he said, No, this is Adam. He says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, you know, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate it. And the Lord said to the woman, what's this that you have done? The woman said, no, no, the spirit, the serpent, he's the one that deceived me. He did it. (laughs) Why are people not at peace? Well, it started right here. People were at peace with God. They were at peace in creation. They were at peace with one another. And look at just in this one event, they've now become scared of God, aware of their flaws, and they're blaming each other for everything. Tell me that doesn't sound like you open the newspaper and it's just still the same thing. Why do people need peace? When Paul says grace and peace, you can't have peace until you have grace. But why do we need peace? Well, it started right here. The peace was disrupted when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Sin came into the world, and the effects of sin here are, I, don't want, to, I want to hide from God now. Let me ask you, do you like to go to church when you're in sin? No. Now that's what they're doing. They're hiding from God, and they're trying to, I think this is really important too, they're trying to cover themselves. They're trying to say, 
well, I hear God coming. I, need, I know I need to get out in front of him, so I'll cover myself. And then that will make me, you know, able to be, you know, it's kind of like you can look at him like this, you know, like, oh, I have to admit this to you, but, you know. And I'm taking the effort upon myself to make some sort of covering now to deal with my sense of my flaw. This is really interesting to me. We're not naturally at peace because we're all born in sin. And so we're born with the tendency to want to hide from God, and we're born with the tendency to try to cover this deep sense that we have that there's something wrong with us, right? Sin puts us at war with God, war with others, and war with ourselves. You see that there. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves coverings, tried to cover themselves And he says, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself from you. Because we know something is wrong with us, because we know something's wrong with us, and you might say, I don't know that there's anything wrong with me. Well, if I ask your wife, she'll tell me. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Uh, Pastors always say that. We know something is wrong, so we attempt to remedy this situation by our own efforts. And that takes effort, Right? Fig leaf's covering. That's why so many people are not at peace today in 2020. Do you know that they're primarily in the Bible, especially in the parable of the uh, lost, or the parable of the lost son, or the two sons? There are primarily two ways that people try to cover themselves or try to avoid God, try to hide from God. There's the way of being bad, and there's the way of being good, right? I know something is wrong with me, So I'm like the prodigal son, and I say, to heck with it. I don't need anything. I'll just go off, and I'll do my own thing. And the next thing you know, I'm in the pig pen eating pig food, living in Vegas on the corner, you know. And um, I've tried to avoid God that way. Then there's the other way of trying to avoid God, and that's by being really good. That's what the Pharisees did. And everybody today has this sense that there's something wrong within them, and they go and they try to cover that, and they try to remedy that by either being bad, by running from God, or by being super religious and trying to do all the things and check the right boxes and be goody two-shoes, and I've pleased you, haven't I, God, with my own works? And neither of those things are peaceful, are they? Sin's fun for a little bit, but you end up in the pig pen. Morality, trying to avoid God through morality, that's, there's no peace in that because you never know if you do it well enough. And if you do think you are doing it well enough, then you become a critical jerk to everybody else and you're criticizing everybody else and how they're, and you're saying, well, I'm doing better than they are. It must be, well, they're doing better than me. Oh, no, I got to get, you know, and you're constantly doing this and you're never at peace. That's why Paul, what he says here, grace and peace, this is profound. This is Christian theology in two words. People are trying to avoid God today being workaholics, alcoholics, addictions, sexaholics, moneyaholics, look, lookaholics, <laughs> intellectaholics, <laughs> humor. That's another way people try to avoid God. They try to be, well, I'm acceptable. I'm pers- I can be okay in this world because I'm the funny guy. Codependency. I can avoid God because I can get everything from you that I need. Religion. The biggest way, one of the biggest, most dangerous things that people use to avoid God. We were talking about it before service. If I can do all the right things that the religion has told me to do, I can essentially avoid my need for forgiveness because I can say, I don't need forgiveness. Look at the way that I keep these Ten Commandments. Good works and morality. Now, these efforts are not sufficient. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. This is super cool. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. And it says there, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So Adam and Eve made a mess of their relationship with God. They want to hide from him. They want to cover themselves. They do it in a way that's just not sufficient. And so God has mercy on them, and he comes and he gives them a covering. And there's bloodshed involved with it, isn't there? It's of skins. What's what's God trying to tell people all the way from the beginning of the Bible? There's a sacrifice needed for your sins. 
and you can't do it yourself. And the only way that you're going to get forgiven with your sins, the only way you're going to go back to walking in the cool of the day, not fearing the voice of the Lord, not continuously trying and trying to present yourself as acceptable and good, the only way that you're going to get out of that mess is by receiving the covering that God has provided for you, and that's Jesus Christ. And it's a gift of his grace, you see. Unmerited favor towards the undeserving sinner. When we were in our sins, Christ died for us. Isn't that something? All the way through the Bible, cover to cover, the same story. God telling you, yes, you have messed up. Yes, you fall short. Yes, your works are as filthy rags before him. Yes, Yes, behind closed doors, all the things you think about yourself when you, you know, I've so I've just fall short here, I'm bad here, I did this, I did that. All of that stuff, all of that stuff. God would say to you, I know. But stop trying to cover yourself. Stop trying to defend yourself. God would say to you, stop trying to have the perfect life of morality and and trying to get me to accept you by how good you are behaving. Try to, you know, stop living your life apart from God. You don't have to respond to that sense of inadequacy. You don't have to respond to that sense of being deeply flawed with works, with you doing something. The way to respond to that deep sense of inadequacy that we all have is to open up to God's grace and to receive the covering that he has provided. Isn't that something? I mean, he takes you just as you are and he covers you. Maybe you haven't ever had peace, you know, real true peace. Maybe that's because you've never come to God based on his grace. Maybe you're constantly trying to like barter with God. You're trying to constantly give your record to him saying, God, I know I must be right with you now because I stopped living the way that I used to. I broke up with that girl that I shouldn't have been with. I moved out of the house with her. I cleaned up my act. Now I go to church. And and maybe you're trying to get God to love you by giving him your bio. You're saying, look at all these things I've done. Look at how good I've become. There's no peace in that. Man, that's so cool. God's way for peace is a gift received by faith. Turn to Ephesians. I want to just give you a few more and we're done here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. You thought I was going to say Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 if you've been around for a while. I'm not going to say that because you should have that memorized. I don't have to do anything to be loved by him. I don't have to do anything but receive his grace to be saved. He says, grace and peace to you. Ephesians 2, verse 5, look at this one. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And then it says, by grace you have been saved. Okay, now I'll go to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Ah, couldn't, couldn't hold out. Mike, say it real loud. You've got to memorize. Don't even do it from your Bible. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, that anyone can boast. Amen and amen. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that has nothing to do with you. Not of works, only of grace. Titus 3, 4, and 7. Man, this is my favorite Bible. If I was going to get a tattoo, I'd get this whole thing tattooed, but it would be like my whole arm, you know? It's a long verse. Titus chapter 3. I'm not going to get a tattoo, by the way. Those are, no. I'll get these taken off. Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the kindness, I'll let you get there. You're still flipping. Titus 3, 
verses 4 through 7. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Man cannot experience true peace until he receives God's grace. True peace is the result of an understanding that our salvation rests on what God has done rather than on what we must do. And so when he says grace and peace, it's important that they're in that order. And he is saying a heck of a lot more. Um, Like I say, that's Christianity, all in those two words. Now, In conclusion, you can see grace and peace are two very important words. Maybe you've never come to the Lord on that footing today. Maybe you've never just said, Lord, I need you to save me. I need to just take this whole trying to earn and deserve mentality, being worthy. I need to take all of that and just put that aside. I I tremble today when I hear youth ministers because it's a really big thing today with youth trying to convince them that they are worthy of God's love. I've heard that countless times from people trying to convince people and they say they're dealing with depression, they're dealing with teenage things, and they say, no, you're worthy. You deserve God's love. And here's here's the thing that's so remarkable about God's love. There isn't a person on this planet that deserves God's love or that is worthy of it. But God is so loving that he loves even the undeserving. And that's what his grace is, is he gives this grace to people that are not deserving. Maybe, that is, maybe that's the one thing today, is just to take that whole notion of being worthy or deserving and to say, wow, I am not worthy and I don't deserve it, but he wants to give it. And so I want to take it. Maybe that's where you're at here today. And if you will open up your arms, if you'll open up your heart to God's grace, you will receive the peace that passes understanding. If you will just lay at his feet and say, just take me just as I am, Lord. I know you love me. You want to give me your grace. And you want to save me. And I just open myself to that. I just want to receive that here today. Let's pray to that end together. Father, I thank you for the word that you've given us that teaches us that salvation is by your grace. And Lord, what a sweet word this is, Lord. It brings just tremendous emotion to us, God, that this whole fight is over. That through salvation in Christ that we can come back into that fellowship with you, not wanting to hide from you, not wanting to offer our works to you, not trying to cover ourselves through whatever we've been trying to cover ourselves with. Lord, that we can just humbly open and receive from you. Father, that's our heart today. I thank you, Lord, for reminding those here today that needed a good reminder of this. I pray for those today, maybe that this is the first time that they've heard this. Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would work this deep in our hearts, that we would learn to live in this peace. As uncomfortable as it may be sometimes, God, it's hard for me at times to think that that I can't earn and deserve and merit and achieve. And it's hard to stay in this for some reason, Lord. But I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would help us all to live as people of grace, people receiving from you. Lord, we know it's just not only your grace that saves us, but your grace that sustains us, your grace that calls us to ministry, your grace that enables us, Lord. Thank you for these two beautiful words that you've forever written in your word so we can be reminded and we can be taught. Thank you, Father, that you're for us that you sent your son as that covering that you've provided, fixing the breach between you and us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Work these truths in our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.